Give us some direct feedback, critique. What are we doing poorly? What could we be doing better? And what's your hope for our potential as a, as a service? If you are running Twitter, by the way, do you want to run Twitter? <laughs> what would you do? We will get back to the Elon's answer, but before we do that, let's go back in time to have a better understanding how it all started and where did it all go wrong for one of the biggest social media networks on the internet today. Forget blogging and MySpace. If you really want to stay connected, there is a new service and supposedly it is the next big thing. It's a name you can't forget. It's called Twitter. The early days of any company are roller coaster, but Twitter's story is rockier than most. According to the official story of Twitter's founding, ex-Google employee Evan Williams had a startup called Odia. <laughs> So you have personally been at the forefront of a lot of the Web 2.0 technologies. I mean, you got Blogger, we had Odeo doing the whole podcasting thing, and now we've got Twitter, which is basically almost becoming synonymous with email and blogging these days. I mean, people say, oh, we're doing the Twitter thing. And so it's grown huge, too. I mean, It was going to be a podcasting platform, a truly innovative idea at that time. Evan asked his friend named Christopher Biz Stone to join him. But there was a problem. How many of you uh, know what podcast? How many of you heard of podcasting? Great. How many of you, you actually know what it is? Okay. How many of you have listened to a podcast? And how many of you have actually subscribed to a podcast? Okay, great. So let me start at the beginning and tell you what this is all about. Podcasting is a word that's concatenation of iPod and broadcasting, right? Put together podcasting. And what podcasting is, it's. Um, started off as Wayne's World for radio. Think of it that way, right? Where you've got anybody could make a radio show and put it on the internet and broadcast it out there and anybody else could listen to it. And then uh, what you could do is because people like to put out multiple episodes of their radio show, you could subscribe to a radio show. And every time it's updated, you'll get the update uh, right on your computer and it'll go into your iPod when you sync your iPod, right? Pretty cool. Or when Apple launched iTunes podcasting platform, which was built into every iPod and made Odeo's podcasting startup irrelevant, Evan, Christopher, and another Odeo employee at that time, named Jack Dorsey, decided to create something called Twitter instead. I'm actually uh, I'm an employee of Obvious, which is the company that uh, owns Twitter. And, and Odeo. Right? And Odeo. And I'm um, just spending a lot of time working on Twitter. I'm doing the same thing. I do some of the, uh, the code as well and the web design. And I just take the glory for these guys as well. <laughs> you made it up, right? It's all your fault? Uh, no, I didn't. It's, it's more Jack's fault. But uh, I'm the founder of Obvious and um, do various things. One day in February 2006, Glass, Dorsey and developer Florian Weber presented Jack's idea to the rest of the company. It was a system where you could send a text to one number and it would be broadcasted out to all of your friends. And before we get going, well, can you tell us what Twitter is? Because some people who are watching may not even know what Twitter is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Twitter is a way to keep connected with your friends. It's, it's a way to, it's, it's basically mini blogging. It's a very low barrier to entry way to blog what you're thinking about. Um, Anywhere from your phone. Yeah, I'd be referred to as microblogging. Micro yeah, people yeah. actually yeah. Twitter about blogging. <laughs> <laughs> they say I'm, I'm updating my blog. Right yeah. <laughs> I, how, I mean, how does it differ from a traditional blog, or how is it similar? We we have we have some different input methods. The the major one being the phone. Mm -hmm. We also have IM. The other major constraint is we limit everything to 160 characters. Okay. Um, so these are very short, focused updates, and they're usually personal. And they're usually about just random things you're doing during the day, instead of being a very composed article right. or, right. you know, a normal blog post. We're encoding the... What are you doing? ...show in a moment. Pulling out the big iron. Yeah. This is going to be some exciting... Site. Well, you see, Twitter's there, so you Does can... Does this just send, like, emails out to thousands of people? Pretty much. Oh, how annoying. 
No, it tells everybody what you're doing at that moment. This is party like software. A, is it like, do you, do you get a separate email for every time you hit the enter key? You would not of... believe how many people I know that are living on this software. Oh, man. Everyone agrees that original inkling for Twitter sprang from Jack Dorsey's mind. Dorsey even has drawings of something that looks like Twitter that he made years before he joined Audio. And Jack was obviously central to the Twitter team. There's of questions that are generated by this. And the first is, is it possible that making a cell phone call could soon become a thing of the past? And is it possible that the ever popular MySpace, even blogging, are slowly being eaten by this thing called a Twitter, where you're about to learn what a Twitter is, and you're also about to learn how it's slowly worming its way into a presidential campaign? Evan Williams and Jack Dorsey have historically been rivals, battling for power and influence internally while taking turns at the helm of Twitter in the company's early days. Dorsey was Twitter's first CEO, but as portrayed in Nick Bilton's book about Twitter's early days, Hatching Twitter, he was a bad manager who took credit for everything, handled criticism poorly, and didn't know how to manage. As a result, he was quickly replaced by Williams in 2008. Dorsey was essentially booted from the company. When Williams was later replaced by Dick Costola in 2011, Dorsey returned as a Twitter's executive chair with a vengeance. When Jack Dorsey was appointed as the part-time CEO in 2015, he has continued to lead the company until the end of 2021, when he stepped down and was replaced by Paraka Gravel, the current CEO of the company. Ever since the company was founded in 2006, the lack of leadership and financially viable decision-making became glaringly obvious. One of the most vocal critics of Twitter's business model, or better lack of it, is NYU professor of marketing, Scott Galloway. I think if you look at product innovation, Twitter looks scarily 2015, so I just don't... The role for Jack Dorsey is for him to declare victory and leave and be kicked upstairs uh, to chairman. So uh, in terms of his comments, I find his comments are slow and thoughtful and the beard and the nose ring don't make you thoughtful, they just make you slow. I, I just find he's, his comments are encephaletic, irrational, nonsensical, anemic, and make no damn sense. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any excuse. I think our idolatry of innovators is in full swing here where we decide someone who's a billionaire and the founder of a tech company should play by different standards than every other CEO or every other leader in corporate America. This is a company that is fueled on rage, fueled on hate, and has done the ultimate slow roll, not as effectively as Facebook, they invented the slow roll, but has delayed and obfuscated any real change, and we continue to see this platform be weaponized by bad actors. Although Evan Williams stepped down as a board member in 2019, the current CEO of the Medium.com blogging platform has been a thoughtful Twitter critic. In 2017, while still being a board member, he said that the advertising business that supports digital media is a broken system. A not necessarily untrue, yet interesting thing to say when you sit on the board of a company that makes its money through advertising. As reported by Vox Media Recode, he openly contemplated whether or not Twitter helped Donald Trump to claim the victory in elections and apologized if it did. A rather remarkable statement to make, but perhaps this apology perfectly reflects a political spectrum and conversations behind the closed doors at Twitter. But financial and leadership troubles is not the end of the story. The biggest problem, and perhaps the one which has motivated Elon Musk to make an offer in the first place, is the free speech question and the left-leaning political agenda at the helm of Twitter's management team. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Elon Musk needs no introduction. He has amassed one of the biggest followings on the social media platform over the years, thanks to his trolling skills and sense of humor. He is a self-described free speech absolutist who thinks Twitter has the potential to be the platform for free speech around the globe and believes free speech is a societal imperative for a functioning democracy. You tweet a lot. I, I use my tweets to express myself. <laughs> Some oh people my use God. their hair. I use Twitter. Twitter is a war zone. 
somebody's gonna jump in the war zone, it's like, okay, you're in the arena, let's go. But his actions speak louder than words. When it comes to success and achieving goals, Elon leaves no stone unturned. He saved the space industry, he saved the electric car movement. Now, eccentric billionaire wants speech to be free on Twitter, and the left just can't handle that. And there are no reasons not to believe him. In his most recent interview at TED conference, Elon Musk said that his intentions are not economical in nature. This is a, this is not a, a, a way to sort of make money, uh, you know. I think this is, it's just that I think this is, um, this could, uh, my, my strong intuitive sense is that uh, having a public platform that is maximally trusted um, and, 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 and broadly inclusive um, is extremely important to the future of civilization. But you've, um, you've described I, yourself. I, I don't care about the economics at all. But a Twitter board seat didn't work out for Musk, who secured a 9.2% stake in the company in recent weeks. He made an offer to take the company private. Wells, wealthiest billionaire, Elon Musk offered to buy Twitter for $52.40 a share. And the number 420, which is often used to reference all things cannabis and often seen in filings, tweets, interviews and businesses related to Musk, has appeared yet again. But this time, the offer was no joke. Elon Musk getting serious about taking over Twitter. The billionaire says he has secured $46.5 billion in funding to buy the social media company. Musk personally putting up $21 billion of his own money, he says, as part of the deal. Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, and other firms covering the rest in a debt financing. That's basically a loan. Now, Musk also says he is exploring a tender offer to acquire shares directly from shareholders. Sure, some might say that the bid might be too low and it undervalues Twitter's financial potential. But it seems that the price is not the main argument in this story. Unlike other social media platforms, such as Instagram or TikTok, that mainly focusing on a visual aspect of our social communications, Twitter remains the primary online space to openly exchange ideas and keep the public conversation going. I think it would be helpful to differentiate between real uh, and, you know, like, is this a real, a verified, like a real, not just like a verified thing, but like, is this a real person or is it a, a botnet or a, a sort of troll army or something like that? Um, you know, so maybe there's like you can say, okay, what are the comments from basically how do you tell if the feedback is, is real or someone trying to manipulate the system or, or probably real or probably trying to manipulate the system? So some way to differentiate between uh, the, this is this is a a, a real person versus a um, you know this is someone trying to just uh, gain your game in the system. Um, like you know, I see like, and I'm sure you guys say it all the time, are people trying to manipulate the system with, with, with just, that they're trying to sway public opinion, um, and, and sometimes it can be very difficult to figure out what's, what's real public opinion and what's not. Um, you know, what do people actually want, what are people actually upset about versus um, manipulation of the, of, of the system by various um, interest groups, um, and there are many, many such groups. Twitter is the platform of choice for politicians, scientists, celebrities, media representatives, and most importantly, for all of us who are willing to participate in a public conversation and freely express our ideas. When the brightest minds of our society must be cautious of what they say on Twitter in order to avoid shadow banning or complete removal from the platform, we must ask ourselves where this is all going and what is the ultimate outcome when free speech becomes just another term in the dictionary and loses its true meaning? I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying this is, that I have all the answers here, um, but I, I, I do think that we want to be just very reluctant to delete things and, and have um, just, just be very cautious with, with, with per permanent bans. Uh, you know, t timeouts I think are better. Or, in, in my view, uh, Twitter should. Um, match the laws of the, of the country of, and, and, and really, you know, that, that, there's an obligation to, to do that. Um, uh, but going, be going beyond that um, and having it be, 
unclear who's making what changes to who to, to where, uh, having tweets sort of mysteriously be promoted and demoted with no insight into what's going on, uh, having a black box algorithm uh, promote some things and other not not other things. I think this can be quite dangerous. Whether he will succeed or not, Elon Musk is right that if there is going to be a platform on which people are free to debate, they must actually be free to do so. This is Digital Goody. Have a good day.